हेलो शानू शाल वी बिगिन यस अनीता वी कैन बिगिन सर इज कमिंग हियर ओके 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 हरि ओम अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू वन एंड ऑल जॉइंट हियर रिस्पेक्टेड प्रिंसिपल डॉक्टर के वी सुरेंद्रन द रिसोर्स पर्सन ऑफ द डे मिस्टर शिवशंकर राजमोहन रिसर्च स्कॉलर कनूर यूनिवर्सिटी माई कोलीग्स एंड डियर पार्टिसिपेंट्स वेलकम यू ऑल द सेकेंड डे ऑफ द लेक्चर सीरीज अंडरस्टैंडिंग द ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन होस्टेड बाई पी जी डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश इन एसोसिएशन विद द आई क्यू एस सी टूडे द सेशन डील्स ऑन द टॉपिक स्ट्रक्चरलिज्म टू पोस्ट स्ट्रक्चरलिज्म बाई मिस्टर शिव शंकर राजमोहन द सेशन इज ऑल्सो लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग इन आर यूट्यूब चैनल वी रिक्वेस्ट द रजिस्ट्रेंट्स हु कुड नॉट जॉइन हियर प्लीज डू वॉच द लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग on behalf of the chinmay arts and science college i once again welcome you all for an interesting session by mr shiv shankar may i invite our principal to address the participants good morning and uh, welcome to the second edition of the webinar series understanding the transformations organized by the department of english chinmay arts and science college for women chala kannur in the state of kerala today as has been indicated the topic of presentation is structuralism to posturalism and the speaker is sri shivachangar rajmohan ak who is a research scholar at kannur university on my personal behalf i take the opportunity to extend a warm welcome to the speaker of the day sri shivachangar rajmohan and to all the viewers who have chosen to be with us this morning in fact it has been an overwhelming response on the first day of the series held on 18th of this month and i hope the same trend will continue i wish you a great time ahead and expect your participation in our future endeavors as well before i close i place on record my appreciation to ms shanu karun the head of the department of english Ms Lyra and Ms Sandhya of the same department and Ms Anitha Haridas head of the department of computer applications who is extending her uh, technical support thank you thank you one and all thank you sir let me invite Ms Lyra to introduce the resource person hari om and warm greetings to one and all present here on the second day of the webinar series understanding transformations hosted by the pg department of english and iqac of chinmay arts and science college for women chala kannur the resource person for today's session is mr shivashankar rajmohan ak who will be speaking on the topic structuralism to post structuralism let me present to you a brief bio data of mr shivashankar rajmohan he started his career as an assistant professor in 2014 at stm college post graduate department of english and also worked as a guest faculty in the naval academy ermala in 2015 currently he is a research scholar at kannur university he has won a number of awards and distinctions to name them he was honored with the herman hess university fellowship in 2019 issued by herman hess university foundation he received the best ma dissertation award in 2015 this is a state level award given for the best ma dissertation by unity women's college kerala he secured the first rank for ma english in 2014 in the kannur university He bagged the best outgoing student award twice in 2014 at Department of Studies in English Kannur University and in 2012 at Sri Narayana College. He was the Kannur District Kalari Paitha champion for 6 years consecutively. Consecutively. He it is an award issued by the District Sports Council. He also won bronze medal in the Kerala State Kalari Paitha Championship. in 2009 and won silver medal twice in kerala state kalari paitha championship in 2007 and 
He has to his credit a number of publications. To name a few, two poems, The Period and When She Leaves, the real, uh, sorry, the public, uh, it was published in uh, to, uh, 2018 and appeared in Diotima. The Real and the Ideal, the Unthought Axiom of Selves on Social Media, published in the year 2016, again appeared in Diotima. Hypervigilance and Paranoia, Problematizing Self on Social Media, published in the year 2006, appeared in Literary Endeavor. The Sword of Tipu Sultan, a study on the historical and functional representation of Tipu Sultan in 2015, which appeared in Sh Shodhana. He is a scholar who is widely read and well, and will definitely help us to understand more on structuralism to post-structuralism. Uh, Over to Shiva Shankar. Um, Thank you. Before uh, we start my the session, audio clear? few instructions to the delegates. Dear delegates, please keep your mic muted throughout the session. You can post your queries in the chat box and also in the live chat enabled in the YouTube channel. An attendance and feedback form will be posted in the chat box towards the end of the session. Please fill in the details to confirm your participation and to receive the e-certificate. And we welcome the resource person, Mr. Shiv Shankar. Shiv Shankar, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, is my Hello? Yes, Shiva. Is my it's audio clear? Yes, clear. Yeah, it's clear. We can hear you. Oh. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So, good morning and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. It was, it was a wonderful introduction. Uh, now, um, I was asked uh, to initiate a discussion on the uh, transformation from post and believe me I would always put the term uh, you know put these terms structuralism and post structuralism in quotation marks and that signals my unwillingness to mount a defense of a theoretical position reified as a monolith uh, to be precise I see post structuralism as a category under which many different approaches are subsumed in other words post structuralism is less a body of theory than a perspective on all theory. And its essence, I would say, is the willingness, and by which I mean all forms of authority, including its own. Now, we shall have a discussion on that. We shall engage with that a little later. Um, let, me, let me begin my discussion on structuralism, and from there we will take it up. Literary structuralism flourished in the 1960s as an attempt to apply to literature the methods and insights of the founder of modern <clears throat> structural linguistics, Ferdinand de Saussure. Now, let me try to articulate a few of his central propositions. Now, I'm not going to um, uh, have a detailed discussion on fundamental Saussurean notions because every in detail, but let me just broadly talk about it. Now, Saussure viewed language as a system of signs which was to be studied synchronically. And what does that mean? It means to study um, language as a complete system at a given point in time, rather than the iconically, um, in the sense that language in its historical development. Now, each sign was to be seen as a, a being made up of a signifier, which is a sound image, or its graphic equivalent and a signified. The consign Saussure signified is not the actual objective thing in the external world of reality. Suppose when you're talking about tree, the signified of the tree is not the actual tree that you might find in your backyard, but the mental image or the concept of that reality which we carry in our mind. Now, according to Saussure, the relationship between the signifier and the signified is an, is an arbitrary one, and everybody knows that. And what does this mean? It means that there is no inherent correspondence between my name and the individual that I am, other than cultural or this particular name for a long time, and that's why I am this. 
there's there's no other cor- uh, correspondence between the individual that i am and the name shiv shankar this is roughly what socio talks about socio goes on and claims that each sign in the system has meaning only by virtue of its difference from other signs to give you an example the sign cat c a t cat has meaning not in itself but because it is not cap or cat or bat now socio was not investigating what people actually said he was concerned with the objective structures of signs which made their speech possible in the first place and then this is what he referred to as the law the long of language he was not interested in the individual utterance or or what he calls as parole um of what people actually mean when they speak or the emotion with which people speak Interested in all that. That in order to study language effectively, the the, the reference of the signs, in other words, the things they act actually did he play? Structuralism in general, in general, is an attempt to sort of apply this linguistic theory of Saussure to objects and activities other than language itself. Structuralism, as the term suggests, is concerned with structures and more particularly with examining the general laws by which they work. In other words, like Roland Barthes, you can view a myth, wrestling match, system of tribal kinship, restaurant menu, or oil painting, everything as uh, as uh, uh, is my audio clear? I think somebody has just uh, posted something. Are you able to listen to me? Is my voice breaking? we are able to listen shiva but uh, at times it's sort of getting stuck that's all otherwise it's clear okay uh, so uh, shall i continue yes yes yeah continue continue shiva i don't think there's a major issue it's only with connectivity okay. at times all right all right <laughs> yeah i was uh, yeah i was talking about um, signs in general mm-hmm. sig and the signs in general um uh, from from the perspective of structuralism you can see everything as a sign you know a uh, wrestling match or or you know anything a painting everything can be uh, sort of understood as as a structure or a system and then what a structuralist would try to do is to i still set these signs are combined into into meanings Now, structuralism, as Frederick Jameson has put it, is an attempt to rethink everything in terms of linguistics. Now, Saussure's linguistic views influenced the Russian formalists, although formalism is not itself exactly structuralism. Formalism views literary texts structurally and then and suspends attention to the referent in order to examine the sign itself. Now, formalism, unlike structuralism, is not particularly concerned with meaning. as or with the deep laws and structures underlying uh, uh, you know texts if it was if it was the russian formalist roman yakobson who provided a a major link between formalism and and modern day structuralism yakobson was the leader of the moscow linguistic circle a um a formalist school founded in in 1915 and in 1920 he migrated to prague to become one of the major theoreticians of the prague linguistic circle the prague link the, the the prague school of linguistics which includes people like the uh, roman yakov and mokorovsky felix felix wadika and, and and others others they represent a kind of transition from formalism to modern day structuralism now they sort of elaborated the ideas of formalists but systematized systematized them uh, more firmly with the framework of saussurean linguistics Jacobson later migrated to America where he met um uh uh the, the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss during the Second World War and uh um our relationship um you know sort of develops much of the modern day structuralism structuralism proper contains a a distinctive doctrine which is not to be found in formalism this is an important distinction um and what is this uh, distinctive thing that structuralism carries within itself and which is not there in formalism 
Now, it is the belief that the individual units of any system have meaning only by virtue of their relations to one another. Now, consider the example of a poem, another image of the moon. As a formalist, you are interested in how these images fit together to form a structure. But you become a hardcore structuralist only when you claim that the, the meaning of each image is wholly a matter of its relation to the other image. The image do not have a substantial meaning, but a relational one. That's a very important distinction. You do, you, you, you do not need to go outside the poem to, um, to, to what you know about suns and moons to explain them. They explain and differ. What is, notable, uh, you know, what is notable about this kind of analysis is that, like formalism, structuralism, hardcore structuralism, brackets off the actual content of the story and, and, and then concentrates entirely on the form the form of the literary text. In other words, you could replace characters of the story with entirely different elements and still have the same story. Now, just think about Malayalam cinema, for example, for the last 50, 60 years. It has been the same thing. You know, the Hindu, every cinema fundamentally operates on, on, on this triangle principle. As long as the structure of relations between the units is preserved, the individual units are replaceable. Now, structuralism is quite uh, indifferent to the um, to the to the cultural value of its objects. Um, in other words, there is no great literature and pulp fiction in in structuralist points of view. Structuralism is analytical and not evaluative. It doesn't evaluate a literary work and say that to say that um, it is a. Um, I would say that it is a calculated affront to common sense. It refuses the obvious meaning of the story and seeks instead sort of to isolate certain deep structures within it, within the literary text, which are not apparent on the um, surface of the text. Now, it does not take the text at face value, but it places the text into a, into a uh, quad object. While Socio divided sign into two, I am a American counterpart and the founder of semiotics. Semiotics is the systematic study of the, the philosopher C.S. Spurs. He identified three basic kinds of sign. There was the iconic sign where the sign somehow resembled what it stood for. For example, you and your photograph. Your photograph somehow resembles you, the actual individual. So there is a sense of resemblance. Now, according to C.S. Spurs, this is the iconic sign. Now, the second one is the indexical sign. Dex now, indexic indexical sign is something in which the sign is somehow associated with what it is a sign of. Uh, like the way a smoke is associated with fire. Now, wherever there is fire, you, you know that there has to be smoke or, or, or something like spots with measles. If you have measles, then it's quite understood that you have spots on your face. Now, the sign is somehow connected uh, uh, with a referent. This, this, according to C.S. Peirce, forms the indexical sign. And the third form of sign, the symbolic sign, where, as with Saussure, the sign is only arbitrarily or conventionally linked with its referent, like the Saussurean notion. Now, while the leading Soviet semiotician of the school of Tartu, Yuri Lotman, in his book, The Structure of the Artistic Text and the Analysis of the Poetic Text, introduces the notion of the reader's horizon of expectations. Now, it is the reader. I mean, remember, Socio never talks about the reader. C.S. Peirce never talks about the reader. But whereas this particular person. A, a, a structuralist theoretician who introduces the notion of the reader within the context of, of literature or literary analysis. Now, it is the reader, according to him, who, by virtue of certain receptive codes at his or her personal you know, disposal, identifies an element in the work as a device. Now, the device is not simply an internal feature of the text, but one but something that is perceived through a particular code and against a definite textual background. A person's poetic device, to give you an example, uh, what 
duplicative of somebody else's poetic device. For that somebody else, it is just an ordinary speech. But for you, something you know suddenly looks like a poetic device. Everything depends on the textual background of of the reader. All right. Now, uh, what am I trying to do here? I was, in fact, uh, taking you to various approaches within structuralism, and I'm, I'm not going to have a very detailed discussion of all these things. Now, structuralism, the, the point is this. Structuralism transformed the study of poetry and revolutionized the study of narrative. That, now, it created a literary science called narratology, and the most important, most influential practitioners of narratology, you know it. Uh, the Lithuanian A.J. Gramus, the Bulgarian French people, uh, you know, uh, the people include people like Todorov and the French critic Gerard Jornet and Claude Bramont and Roland Barthes, all these people. These people are associated with, uh, of, uh, with, with narratology and the most influential practitioners of narratology. Now, the modern structuralist analysis Gathering work on myth by the French structural anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. Now, Lévi-Strauss viewed apparently different myths as a uh, as variations on a number of basic themes. Now, what Lévi-Strauss was trying to say was that beneath the immense heterogeneity of myths, there there are certain constant universal structures uh, to which any particular myth could be reduced. Now, in other words, Greek mythology and Indian mythology are two different and distinct forms of myth, two different surface level. But according to lévi if you go into the deep structure, if you go deeper into these mythologies, deep within every myth, irrespective of cultural differences, there are certain structural elements, and these elements are common across the globe. This is the idea of uh, levi strauss structuralism. Now, these relations, now th this is where it becomes interesting. These relations, levi strauss uh, you know, according to him, were inherent in the human mind itself. These structures are not there in the picture. They're inherently in the human brain. Something like the collective unconscious, which, which Carl Jung talks about. Of course, it is different, but again, somehow it is connected. Now, what is the point here? In studying a body of myth, we are looking less at the narrative content than at the universal mental operations which structure it. Now, to put it differently, myths are devices to think with, ways of classifying and organizing reality. The mind which does all this You know, is not visual subject. Please keep that in mind. In structuralism, specifically in the context of, of Levi Strauss, when we talk about mind, we are not talking about the Freudian mind, the individual's mind. Rather, we are talking about a collective uh, system, a collective mind. Uh, you know, he, he, what he's trying what what he's trying to say is that myths think themselves through people rather than vice versa. They, they, myths have no origin in a, in a particular individual's consciousness. This is important. Now, around the same time, A.J. Gramers came up with his book. Yeah, he came up with his book, uh, Semantic Structural. I think it was around 1960s, 65, around, the, around that time. Now, he was attempting to sort of develop Vladimir Propp's, you know, Vladimir Propp. He was attempting to develop Vladimir Propp's formalistic scheme with the concept of an actant. A-C-T-A-N-T, actant. Now, which is neither a specific narrative nor a character, but a structural unit, according to him. Now, he identifies six actants in any story. You take any story, there are six, six different object, sender, receiver, helper, and opponent. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on this any further. I'm just trying to give you a... a of a broad framework of some of the important theoretical development in the field of structuralism. Now, in mind that Todorov attempts grammatical analysis of, of Boccaccio's famous work, The Cameron. Now, he analyzes characters, I mean, within the, the, the work, characters as nouns and their attributes as adjectives and their actions as verbs. Now, what is the Application can thus be read as a uh, as a kind of uh, 
an extended sentence combining these units in different ways just like just the way you analyze a a sentence and a literary text becomes an extended sentence in other words also had there are jonet coming score 1970s jonet draws on uh, a distinction in narrative between recit which is by which he means the actual order of even history really occurred uh, something that we can infer from the text and and a narration now uh, think about a descriptive story how does it begin it begins with a death uh, somebody is murdered all right and then murder is the last thing that happens in the real life at the at the end there are so many things that go behind the murder but when the movie begins or when the text begins the first thing that we see is the murder all right and from the murder opens for the murder and then um uh, uh we look at how the murder happened now this plot this plot of the little very audio still breaking madam mm-hmm. what shiva could you please check it your yeah could you please check it your end because it's breaking uh our technical department was suggesting that probably yeah. you could switch off your fan yeah oh, oh give me a second i'll switch off my fan one second Anita Kimi Anita you're there okay. Yeah and somebody is also suggesting you can refresh your yeah, screen Yeah Shanu Shanu I'm here Yeah uh, I think uh, the problem is from his hand because the, maybe the bandwidth is not good at his end Uh so somebody was suggesting even refreshing it uh, yeah. Shanu could you please try that Refresh your fine. screen Yeah no, yeah oh, sure. I'm just asking may I try to No problem. Yeah okay give me a second No yeah no problem yeah, Give me a second give me a second uh is there any difference now uh, it's yeah, much clearer yeah it's yeah. much clearer hello yeah much better okay okay uh let me proceed then um hmm, what was i talking about um yeah i yeah, yeah yeah i was talking about uh, jorge janet and uh, yeah i was talking about the book narrative discourse and then i was talking about um the distinction in narrative between receipt and history and in which um um uh the receipt is the order in which events occur in the text whereas history refers to the consequence i mean it, it uh, refers to the sequence in which those events actually occurred you know uh the even refers to the uh, uh the order in which events occurred in the text how it is narrated in the text whereas history refers to the actual order you know in the real life the actual order or uh, the, the sequence yeah uh the screen is not clear <laughs> i i think something is really wrong with the with the network here it was raining here it was raining in the morning and then something is wrong please uh, 
if the audio is clear please uh, you know let's continue may i continue yes yeah, your audio is clear. Audio okay, is then i'll clear. continue yeah. yeah i'll continue i'll continue um all right yeah so uh um uh, uh yeah uh, gerard jonet was also um um uh yeah he he sort of uh, he discerned five central categories of narrative analysis um and then he talked about five different forms of narrative all right i mean five different ways in which you can sort of analyze a narrative let's quickly go through this uh, i'm just trying to give you a taste of structuralism the first thing that he talks about is order you know order an order refers to the time order of the narrative how it may operate in prolepsis or analepsis or anachrony prolepsis refers to anticipation and and analepsis refers to to flashback and then you know you have anachrony you know that now if you look at all these structures is it somebody saying something uh Let's be a little patient. Yeah, I think there's no issue. I'll continue. Okay. Um, yeah. If you if you look at uh, uh, if you look at uh, I mean if you take a narrative, you can always look at the order in which uh, the narrative is organized. Uh, how prolapses happens. How an ellipsis uh, happens, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. The second category, according to Jared Jarnett, is duration. Now, duration signifies how the narrative may omit episodes, expand some episodes, summarize some e- episodes, um, pause a little, and so on. Just um, you know, something like this. If, if, when you when you sit down and write something uh, about something, sometimes you expand certain things, sometimes you do not expand certain things, sometimes you skip certain things. Now, everything comes under the category called duration, according to Jarnett. the third category of analysis according to him is frequency now it's a very interesting category frequency involves questions of whether an event happened once in the story and is narrated once but is narrated several times or happened several times and is narrated several times or happened several times and is narrated only once now this is a very interesting uh, uh a particular event gets repeated in the text sometimes it happens several times but you don't repeat it i mean you don't talk about it that often uh, this is the third category of analysis according to jonet the fourth category uh, it's a little complex kind of a category it's called mood m o o d mood now mood can be subdivided into distance and perspective now distance concerns the um, the relation of the narration to its own materials now it raises questions like um is it a matter of recounting the story or digesting or representing the story mimesis now th- these are two things that you can do something happens in the external world you can represent it word by word even by event you can sort of you know m- mimetically represent it or you can just uh, recount the story summarize it which is called digesting you know uh, this is something that we need to analyze as a structuralist when you analyze a story it also raises questions like is the narrative told in direct indirect or free indirect speech this is another thing that we will uh, analyze and um roughly what we mean by distance and another subcategory of mood as i told you before is perspective now perspective is what might traditionally be called point of view and can also be variously subdivided may know more than the characters less than them or on the same level with the characters the narrator uh, may be a non focalized narrator meaning uh, the, the the narrative is given by an omniscient narrator who is not focalized within the text but outside the text somebody who is outside the text talking about everything like god god is not within is not part of our lives but is somebody who organizes our lives um in a narrative there can also be an internally focalized narration narration which means that there's one character within the text who is narrating everything you know these are different ways in which we can analyze a narrative structurally now the fifth category according to jonet is voice now voice concerns the act 
act of narrating itself what kind of narrator and narrate are implied and a- a- according to this he divides three different forms of narrator and uh, the first category is a heterodigetic narrator a heterodigetic narrator is a narrator who is no narrator see i'm talking about a story i'm narrating a story but i'm not a character of the story it- it's called an heterodigetic narrator and there's something called homodigetic narrator a homodigetic narrator is somebody who narrates and somebody who is within the text and the story is about himself or herself almost like the first person narrative and third one is the autodigetic narrator where the narrator is not only inside the narrative but also a central figure a principal character it's not about that character but that character is a central character that's it so that these are confusing things don't get confused with all these complicated categorization what am i trying to do here i'm just trying to give you a taste of structural analysis of a literary work this is what they do structuralism is all about dividing everything into basic structures now if you look at uh, if you look at these divisions carefully you will realize that one of the significant consequences of structuralism is a supreme disregard for the vagaries of individual thought now it reduces the consciousness of the reader to a mere function of some universal categories so what are the gains of structuralism you know the positive things about structuralism to begin with structuralism represents a remorseless demystification of literature literary work like any other product of language is a co- is is a construct whose mechanisms could be classified and analyzed like the objects of any other science the romantic prejudice that a poem like a person harbored a vital essence a soul which it was a uh, discourteous to tamper with was rudely unmasked you know the structuralist methodology the structuralist method implicitly questioned literature's claim to be a unique form of discourse you know since deep structures could be unearthed from a legal document you take a legal document you can still find a deep structure within it you can also find deep structure within william shakespeare's world famous tragedy so it was no longer easy to assign literature an ontologically privileged status Yet another significant contribution of structuralism was its emphasis on the constructedness of human meaning. Now meaning was neither a private experience nor a divinely ordained occurrence. It was the product of certain shared systems of signification. Now the 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 confident bourgeois belief that uh, that the isolated individual subject was the source and origin of all meaning took a sharp jerk. structuralism insisted that language predates the individual language is not the product of the individual rather individual becomes a product of language a meaning was not natural a question of just looking at something or seeing something and then understanding things as they are you know what structuralism says is that the way you interpret your world depends on the linguistic structure that you that you possess that you have at your disposal a meaning was not something which all men and women everywhere intuitively shared and then articulated in their various tongues and scripts what meaning you uh, you articulate depends on the script you know depends on the st- structure that you share with the other person now with structuralism it was impossible any longer to see reality simply as something out there a fixed order of things which language merely reflected a prior to, you know prior to structuralism we used to believe that there was a natural bond between world and thing you know reality and language we thought that our language opened up for us the world and and, and the reality this rationalist or empiricist view of language suffered severely you know at the hands of structuralism for you know as socior argued the relation between sign and referent was an arbitrary one now if it is so then how could any correspondence theory of knowledge stand you know reality was reflected by language uh reality was not reflected by language but rather produced by language this is the kind of approach that structuralism takes structuralism quite similar to its successor post structuralism has always been incompatible with common sense what is common sense common sense holds that things generally have only one meaning and that this meaning is usually obvious inscribed on the faces of objects that we encounter is that the world is pretty much as we perceive it and our way of perceiving it 
It's the natural one, you know, the, the self-evident one. Now, we know the sun goes around the earth because we can see that the sun goes around, you know, the earth and that that's the reality about it. Now, structuralism, in fact, is a modern inheritor of Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. And why am I saying that? It was Karl Marx who first claimed that the true significance of social process went on behind the backs of individual agents. And after Marx, Freud argued that the real meanings of our words and actions were quite imperceptible to the conscious mind and that the root of everything is in the unconscious mind of the individual. We don't know it. We don't know who we are. Like Freud, structuralism exposes the shocking truth that even our most intimate experience is the effect of a structure. And this is, this is the, uh, the real um, revolution that structuralism introduces. Again, structuralism had its share of problems too, for if the sign systems by which individuals lived could only be, uh, uh, you know, could be seen as culturally variable, the deep laws which governed the workings of these systems were not, you know, they were considered as universal, like Levi Strauss. And for the hardest forms of structuralism, you know, they were universal, embedded in a collective mind, which transcended any particular culture, and which Levi Strauss, very interestingly, suspected to be rooted in the structures of the human brain itself. Now, having characterized the underlying, you know, rule systems of a literary text, all that, what is that the structuralist could do after all these structural analysis? Just sit back and wonder what to do next. They have nothing else to do. You know, they, they've analyzed the structure, they've, you know, taken all the structures out. Now, what do you do with the structure? Where do you go from there? This is the question that worries structuralists. There was no question of relating the work to the realities of which it treated or to the conditions which produced it or to the actual readers who studied it since the founding gesture of structuralism had been to bracket off such realities. Now, um, structuralism could dissect a product or a text, but it refused to inquire into the material conditions of its making since this might mean surrendering to the myth of an origin. Nor were structuralists worried about the you know, the, the product, how the product was actually consumed, about what happened when people actually read works of literature, what role such works played in social relations as a whole. Structuralism was not interested in any of these. Now, let's look at it this way. Traditional criticism, the criticism that uh, was in place before structuralism, had sometimes reduced the literary work to a little more than a window onto the author's psyche. And you know that with Roland Barthes, we have the death of the author. Barthes was specifically trying to attack this traditional inherited criticism, which focuses on the individual author. And then you take a book and you say that whatever that is there in the book is there in the author's mind, you know, representation of the author's psychic reality. Structuralism was responding to this, rather critiquing this. Now, in the act of critiquing this traditional inherited notion, structuralism seemed to make it, uh, you know, seem to open a window onto a universal mind. This is the problem. If traditional critics composed a spiritual elite, structuralists appear to constitute a scientific one, you know, something which is equipped with esoteric knowledge far removed from the ordinary reader. Look at it this way. Do you really think an ordinary reader can look at all these uh, you know, narrative uh, elements like Gerard John has introduced and analyze the text? No. Structuralism was basically trying to create a new form of elitism in which only a select people with a lot of knowledge about structures can analyze a literary text. This is, this is another problem that structuralism uh, you know, um, uh, faces. Now, what defines structuralism, I would say, is a double movement. It bracketed off the real object and it as, as I told you before at the beginning of my lecture, in Saussurian linguistics, we are not talking about the actual reality in the external world, but we are talking about the mental image, the, the concept. The signified is the concept. It also bracketed off the human subject. The work neither refers to an object, nor to the expression of an individual subject. Both these things are bracketed out. And what is left hanging in the air between them is a system of rules. The system has its own independent life and will not stoop to the beck and call of individual intentions. Now, in this sense, one could possibly argue that structuralism is anti-humanist in a sense. It doesn't give a damn about human intentions. 
Now, we may also notice, this is very interesting, we may also notice that Saussure's model of language, like many classical bourgeois models, has no intermediate terms or, or mediations between solitary and the linguistic system as a whole. Now, the fact that someone, you see, when you, when you talk about language and the way it is used, someone may not be just a member of the society, but also a woman, uh, a Muslim, a mother, uh, an immigrant or a refugee. Now, all these factors, structuralism does not take into consideration. They simply slid over all these facts. Now, look at it this way. A privileged man would most certainly speak in a way quite different from that of a, of a subordinate wife. A white man in America might speak a different language from that of a black man living in America. But such factors do not seem to bother structuralists. And then the previous, theory, previous theories of meanings, you know, theories prior to structuralism, dogmatically insisted that the intention of the speaker or writer was always paramount for interpretation. Now, in countering this dogmatism, structuralism rejected the existence of intentions completely. Structuralists avoided what may be called the humanist fallacy in interpretation. Now, what is this humanist fallacy? The naive notion that a literary text is just a kind of transcript of the living voice of a real man or woman addressing us. Now, it did so, it, structuralism did so, only to fall into the opposite trap of more or less abolishing the subject altogether. Now, the ideal reader, somebody who reads, the ideal reader for structuralism is one who would, who's fully equipped with all the technical knowledge essential for deciphering the work to be faultless in applying this knowledge and free of any hampering you know, restrictions. Now, if this model was pressed to an extreme, he or she, the reader, would have to be stateless, classless, ungendered, free of ethnic characteristics and without these limiting structural assumptions. Now, the ideal reader posited by structuralism was in effect a, a transcendental subject absolved from all limiting social determinants. And this transcendental signified is precisely what in post-structuralism we problematize. Now, the shift away from structuralism has been in part, to, to use the terms of the French linguist Emily uh, Benveniste, a move from language to discourse. Language is speech or writing viewed objectively as a chain of signs without a subject. Whereas discourse means language grasped as utterance, as involving speaking and writing subjects, and therefore also, you know, readers and listeners. One of the most important critics of Russian, I mean, Sosurian uh, uh, linguistics was the Russian philosopher and literary theorist Mikhail Bakhtin. Bakhtin in 1929 published a pioneering study entitled Marxism and the Philosophy of Language. Bakhtin had also been largely responsible for what remains the most cogent critique of Russian formalism, reacting sharply against Saussure's objectivist linguistics. And he, at the same time, Bakhtin was also aware, uh, was also critical of the subjectivist alternatives that we have. Bakhtin shifted attention from the abstract system of long to the concrete utterance of individuals in particular social contexts. According to Bakhtin, language was to be seen as inherently dialogic. It could be grasped only in terms of its inevitable orientation towards an other. Language is always directed towards other. You know, the, the, the sign, the sign that Saussure talks about, the sign was to be seen less as a fixed unit, like a signal, than an active component of speech, modified and transformed in meaning, by the variable social tones, valuations, and connotations that it condensed within itself in specific social conditions. You know, it was not simply a matter of asking what the sign meant, but of investigating its varied history as conflicting social groups, classes, individuals, and discourses sought to appropriate language and imbue it with their own meanings. It's not the same language. Language, in short, was a field of ideological contention not a monolithic system. This is how Bakhtin tried to critique structuralism. And then signs were the medium, uh, the, the very medium, material medium of ideology. For Bakhtin, signs are S-I-G-N-S. Signs are the material medium of ideology. 
since without them no values or ideas could exist for bakkan all language just because it is a matter of social practice is inevitably bound up with valuations what do i mean that words words not only do not object but imply attitudes towards them now the, the, for example take for example the tone in which you say open the book you see someone and you tell that person open the book all right and now it's not neutral the tone in which you say open the book can signify how you regard the person how you regard yourself how you regard the book and then the situation that in which we are so the tone is equally important it's something that structuralism never talks about structuralism considered that language moved in this uh, connotative dimension but then simply refused to engage with the full implications of of this dimension now post structuralism in from structuralism to formal i mean to 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 narratology then to bakkenian criticism and then we have post structuralism post structuralism begins by asking a series of questions to structuralism now this movement was initiated as you would probably know by jacques derrida with his you know classic text structure sign and play in the discourse of human sciences presented at a conference on structuralism at john hopkins university in 1966 Now they these are some of the questions that questions raised by Derrida and other post structuralists. Now Saussure look at it this way Saussure argues that meaning in language is not just a matter of difference. Or I mean meaning is a matter of difference. Yeah. Now cat is cat because it is not cap or bat. Now the question is how far is one to sort of press this difference? Cat is also what it is because it is not cad or mat. and math is what it is because it is not map or hat now where do we i'm sorry where do we stop this process it's an endless process where do we stop it now in post structuralism they they say that it would seem that this process of difference in language can be traced round infinitely now comes the crucial post structural question this is obvious now comes the question now if this is so what has become of sociore's idea that language forms a closed stable system that there was a correspondence between a signifier and a signified now sociore says that a signifier and the signified are are like two sides of the same paper you cannot cut one without cutting the other now if every sign is what it is because it is not at all the other sign every sign would seem to be made of a potentially infinite tissue of differences the questions uh, i mean this approach questions sociore's view of sign as a neat symmetrical you know symmetrical unit between one signifier and signified now post structuralism unearths a fundamental paradox in sosurian theory they say that the signified take the example of a signified the signified tree you know the example that sociore uses uh the signified tree is really the product of a complex interaction of signifiers which has no obvious end point meaning is the spin off of a of a potentially endless play of signifiers rather than a concept tied neatly to the tail of a particular signifier uh in other words the signifier does not give us a signified directly if you want to know the meaning of a particular sign suppose you have a word and you don't know the meaning you only have the signifier what do you do you take up a dictionary and you look at the dictionary in the act of looking at the diction looking at the dictionary what do you come up with do you really get a signified suppose you have a word called ecstasy and you don't know what ecstasy means you want to understand the meaning the signified you open the dictionary you look at the word dictionary i mean you look at the word ecstasy you get another word called extreme happiness what is this extreme happiness another signifier now where is the signified this is the post structural question in other words every signified is a signifier language is a system in which you don't really get to a final signified you get only a signifier chain of signifiers endlessly postponed from ecstasy to happiness to you know it it goes on like that the whole dictionary is a signifier a heap of signifiers now if structuralism divided the sign from the referent you know uh the relation is arbitrary post structuralism goes one step further it divides the signifier from the signified Th- this is the rupture now another way of putting what we have just said is is that meaning is not immediately present in a sign 
Since the meaning of a sign is a matter of what the sign is not, its meaning is, is, is always in some sense absent from it too. Meaning is rather a kind of constant flickering of absence and presence together, happening simultaneously. In each sign, we can detect traces of other words, which is excluded, uh, you know, in order to be itself. In other words, uh, I'm just giving you an example. Cap is what it is only by fending off cap and bat. But these other possible signs, you know, cap and bat, because they are constitutive of the cat's own identity, they inhere within the word cat as traces, as ghostly non-presences, as Derrida would put it. Now, instead of being a well-defined, clearly demarcated structure containing symmetrical units uh, of signifiers and signified, it now begins to look much more like a sprawling, limitless web where there is a constant uh, uh, in interchange and circulation of elements, where none of the elements is absolutely definable and where everything is caught up and, and, and traced through um, by everything else. Nothing is ever fully present in science. It is an illusion for me to believe that I can ever be fully present to you in what I say or write, because to use science entails that my meaning is always somehow dispersed, divided, and quite uh, and never quite at one with with myself. Not only my meaning, but me, the individual. Since language is something that I am made of, I am an alien to myself because I think in a language. Suppose I say that I desire something. I love you. The idea of love is again a signifier that I have to, you know, uh, 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 find out from a dictionary. Everything that I do, my, you know, my relations, my desires, my frustrations, everything exists in language. The whole idea that I'm a stable, unified entity is a fiction, according to post-structuralism. I am never fully present to you. Not just that, I am never fully present to myself either. Now, what do I mean that by, by that? I still need to use signs when I, or language, when I look into my mind, when I look into my soul. And this means that I, I will never experience any full communion with myself. Now, it doesn't mean that, please be very careful, it doesn't mean that we have a pure, unblemished meaning, intention or experience, which then get distorted and refracted by the flawed medium of language. No, that's not the point. Since language is the very medium which makes my consciousness, I can never have a pure, unblemished meaning or experience at all. Now, I'm going to wind up in a few minutes from now. Uh, 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 it's almost the last part of my presentation. The actual nature of post-structuralism can be seen in its deconstruction of the classical binary between writing and speech. Now, you know that. Uh, the spoken words are generally considered immediate in the sense that there is no um, you know, medium between my conscious mind and my utterance. My voice becomes an, uh, what do I say? My voice becomes the intimate, spontaneous expression of my mind. At least this is the general perception. In writing, by contrast, my meaning pretends to escape from my control. No, I commit my thoughts to the impersonal medium of the pen, the print, and since the printed text has a durable material existence, it can always be circulated, reproduced, cited, and used in ways which I did not foresee or intend. And then writing, uh, you know, the, the, the general perception is that writing seems to rob me of my being. It is a second-hand mode of communication, a mechanical transcript of, of speech, always removed from my consciousness. Now, this is, this is roughly the general understanding of writing. Now, it is for this precise reason that the Western philosophical tradition, all the way from Plato to Lévi-Strauss, has consistently vilified writing as a mere lifeless, alienated form of expression and consistently celebrated the living voice. Now, if you look at it from a post-structural point of view, behind this prejudice lies a particular view of human being. The idea behind this undue valorization of speech is that a human being is spontaneously able to create and express his or her own meaning. He or she is in full possession of himself or herself. Now, what this theory fails to see is that the living voice is in fact quite as material as print. 
the written word and that since spoken signs like written ones work only by a process of difference and division speaking could be as much a form of writing as writing is said to be a second hand form of speaking this this is a typical derivian deconstruction of the binary between writing and speaking i mean of speech he would say that speaking uh is equally flawed as writing you know the western philosophy has been for a century centered on the living voice and deeply suspicious of the script it has also been in a broader sense logocentric committed to a belief in some ultimate word you know presence essence truth or reality which will act as the foundation of all our thought language and experience for example think of god what is god for us something that anchors our lives everything depends on the god the first principle the western philosophical tradition has also yearned for the sign which will sort of a sign which will give a uh, meaning to all other signs an unquestionable meaning to all other signs the transcendental signified the signified which gives meaning to everything else on the planet all right uh, and then what is this transcendental signified and then we have so many uh, you know contenders for this category god and if you do not believe in god then rationality is your transcendental signified everything has to go through the prism of rationality everything in your life gets meaning through the agency of rationality and, and then if you go to um, now plato plato would say it is the idea you know the theory of ideas or the form and then if you go to spinoza he would say it is substance for some somebody else it is self for somebody else it is the unconscious mind these are transcendental signifiers post structuralism vehemently claims that any such transcendental meaning is a fiction there is no concept which is not embroiled in an open end play of signification shot through with the traces and fragments of other ideas now it's just that out of out of this play of signifiers certain meanings are uh, you know sort of elevated by social ideologies to to a privileged position or or made the center of the world around which we have to you know form our lives consider our own society what are the things that we consider as supreme 20 years before 30 years before uh we would say my religion uh, even today that is a condition is the same but again just for an example uh let's say consider 30 years before somebody would say my god is everything around my god i form my life that was the transcendental thing right uh today we might say that my family my family is my everything i do everything for my family somebody would say i believe in democracy democracy is my transcendental signifier one classic example is that of patriotism look how absurd it is people are dying on the borders in order to you know sort of uh, protect a signifier patriotism uh, no offense meant by the way i i don't mean to um uh vilify the contributions made by people on the border i do respect them with with my whole heart but then again look at the irony behind it. what are we trying to do here we are see patriotism or nation these are just categories these are just signifiers and then we we give a, to, a sense of meaning to it and then we form our lives around it that's it just just that there it are labels it as metaphysical the metaphysics of presence what is metaphysical according to derrida he says that any thought any thought system which depends on an unassailable foundation something that you cannot question a first principle or an unimpeachable ground upon which a whole hierarchy of meanings may be constructed that idea is called metaphysics look at our lives everything everything is centered around metaphysics even your love is centered around the metaphysics a post structuralism believes that any transcendental signified is defined by what it excludes all right uh in a male dominated society man forms the center man is the 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 overarching uh unquestionable dogmatic center but man becomes a man only when he openly declares that he is not a woman it is only by excluding the other category that you become the transcendental signified in other words every transcendental signified is an ironic paradoxical category because transcendental signified is precisely that thing 
which is beyond, way beyond every signified. But in, in reality, as a post-structuralist would say, every transcendental signified depends for its, for its existence on other signifiers and signified which you exclude. And this, this is the kind of rereading that uh, 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 post-structuralism uh, introduces. Now, this, some people would call it, uh, 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 what do I say, um, obsession with uh, a sense of doctrinal obsession with undecidability. Most people would say Derrida doesn't make sense. What is this all about? Questioning everything. Now, I would say that this doctrinal obsession with undecidability, which is a hallmark of post-structuralism, is justified or is justifiable. Now, Derrida is clearly not attempting to form a new new technique of reading. Deconstruction is not a new technique of reading. It is not a new te technique uh, within which using this you can read a literary text and submit a project and then get A grade for it. That's not the point. For deconstruction, I mean, for Derrida, deconstruction is ultimately a political practice. And what do I mean by a political practice? An attempt to dismantle the logic by which a particular system of thought and behind that, a whole system of political structures and social institutions maintain its force. He's not seeking absurdly to sort of deny the existence of relatively determinate truths or meanings or identities. You know, it's not like M. H. Abrams has put it. You know, uh, after reading Derrida, M. H. Abrams has wrote an essay called The Deconstructive Angel uh, in the book, The Theory's Empire, and in which M. H. Abrams says, see, Derrida says, there is no signified. It is a constant uh, uh, you know, postponement of the signifier. But the point is, whatever that Derrida says makes sense to me. I can listen to Derrida and then I clearly understand what this guy is saying. And what does that mean? It means that there is a signified and I can understand that. But far from it. That's not the point that Derrida is trying to make. What Derrida is trying to say is that everything is a construct. There is no inherent meaning to everything. But in a given point of time, you take a space and a time, x axis, axis and y axis, at a given point, at a given place, a word may have a meaning, and that meaning depends for its existence on a power structure. That's it. And then the practice of deconstruction is all about dismantling this hierarchy of power. In a, in a system where man becomes the dominant category and woman becomes the subordinate category, deconstruction would come in and, use, uh, and say that man depends for its existence on the woman and therefore this hierarchy is invalidated. This is a political intervention of, of uh, deconstruction. And then Derrida is actually seeking uh, to see, um, uh, 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 you know, to, to look at all these cultural practices that we take as common sense. To, take, uh, to look at all these things that we value as God-given, as the unquestionable thing. And then he would just make it a, a uh, he would just say that uh, it is a cultural construct that we need to deal with. There's nothing holy about the cow. The holiness of the cow is a construct. And then we can change it any time. Th this is roughly the idea that Derrida is talking about. I know that I uh, took about one, one hour, 15 minutes. I'm not going to extend my lecture any further. Uh, these are some of the things that I wanted to talk about. The, uh, the point uh, on which I'm going to conclude my presentation is this. While structuralism could be understood as a literary movement or a linguistic movement, post-structuralism is a political movement. It's not about reading a particular book by Charles Dickens and trying to find out various forms of meaning built into it. It is about problematizing, critiquing certain power structures, certain imbalances in the society and, and the way in which we valorize certain things and then the way in which we put certain things in the margin. And then, by the way, again, there's this classic text by Jacques Derrida, uh, which talks about the margins of philosophy. Derrida is always interested in the margins, you know, those things that we keep away from the center. And he would say that those things, precisely because it is excluded from the center and put it in the margin, can always intervene and disrupt the center. And th this is roughly the idea that uh, post-structuralism sort of tries to uh, uh, engage with. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 
these are some of the things that I wanted to talk about in the context of the transformation from structuralism to, to post-structuralism. And uh, thank you so much for patiently listening to me and you know, I had I know that there, there there were certain problems with the internet connectivity, and uh, I'm not quite sure my audio was completely there. But thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much. Over to you, ma'am. It's over. Thank you. Thank you, Shiva. I think there are a few questions posted. Could you please answer them, Shiva? Uh, one second. Uh, questions. Oh, oh, in the comment box. Okay. okay. Yeah, one in the second. chat box. One second. Let me pick it up. Uh, There's one Chandini Vishnu. She's asking, can you please tell us about structural anthropology? Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, see, these are two things. All right. Structuralism is primarily a linguistic. Uh, 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 a discipline, um, a discipline that uh, emerged from the field of linguistics, specifically from Ferdinand de Saussure, where everything, I mean, where language was looked at from its basics. Instead of looking at language as a holistic system, you would go deeper into language and identify one sign and it signified. What Levistoff Levis took this idea from structuralism, from, from, uh, sorry, not from structuralism, took this idea from linguistics, and then he tried to apply this in the context of anthropology. Now, he would go to a particular culture, and then he would look at the practice, you know, the rituals of that culture, and then try to form the signifier side of that particular culture. Now, in, in other words, you are basically trying to make a linguistic reading of a culture. This is this is what uh, uh, Levi-Strauss does, um, uh, you know, um, in cultural, uh, in structural anthropology. Yeah, that's that's my response to uh, Shantani. And there's another question by Arpita. So, would you like to share a reading reading list? Uh, reading list. Um, yeah, I, I can give you the names of the critics that I have uh, referred to. I did talk about Saussure, Ferdinand de Saussure. I talked about C.S. Peirce. Then I talked about Vladimir Prop. Uh, I did talk about Gerard Jonat, uh, A.J. Gramis, um, Mikhail Buxton. Uh, I did not talk about Roland Barthes because everybody knows Roland Barthes, but I sort of hinted, um, or sort of uh, pointed my fingers at Roland Barthes when I talked about mythology. And then I also talked about Derrida. These are some of the writers that I uh, discussed in the course of my lecture. All right. Then there is uh, Gayatri. Can you explain the concept of thesis, antithesis? Oh, thesis, antithesis. Synthesis. Now, this is basically a Hegelian notion, which Marx sort of, Karl Marx sort of adopted while talking about uh, his notion of, of uh, Marxism. Now, uh, from a Hegelian point of view, Every society will have two forces, two forces determining its movement. And basically, the assumption is that the society is moving linear, progressing from one point, point A to point B. This is the fundamental assumption. There is a movement for every society, and the movement is a linear one. We are not going backwards. We are going forward, progressing, uh, as Leotard would put it, uh, the meta-narrative of progress. Yeah, from point A to point B, we are moving. Now, that is the fundamental principle. Now, how is this movement happening? At point A, there are two forms of energy. There is a thesis and there is an antithesis. There is one voice which is supporting something and there is another voice which is against it. For example, if you look at the history of human civilization, uh, there was a conflict between feudalism and capitalism. Now, uh, at a particular point in time, Feudalism was in power. It was the unquestionable dogmatic center. When something becomes the unquestionable dogmatic center, something else will emerge. And that uh, emergent force will get into a fight with the existing dog dogmatic structure. And then out of this fight, a new form of culture will evolve, which will be much more enhanced, which will be much more acute, much more sophisticated and progressive than these two. 
and then this process will continue this new thing will become the uh, you know uh, yeah, it, to put it differently uh, let's look at it in the context of ideology there are uh, ideology has two different forms the emergent ideology and uh, the residual ideology and what is this residual ideology something which leaves will always leave its residues now you drink a cup of tea all right and then at the end even if you try your best something will remain something of the tree will re- tea will remain which is called the residual dimension of the tea, of the tea now if feudalism vanishes it will not vanish just like that completely feudalism will you know sort of uh, keep certain things alive you know re- keep certain things under the carpet which is called the residual dimension of ideology now that residual dimension of ideology will always get into a conflict with the emergent form of ideology which is the new form of ideology now the clash is always between the residual and the emergent to give you a classic example in the contemporary world the 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 best example would be the generation gap between your father and you if you are a woman and then you read all these deridian stru- uh, post structuralism leotardian post modernism and then you become a complete post modern individual but whereas your father is the inheritor of a residual ideology of the previous generation so his ideology gets into a conflict with your ideology which is the emergent ideology now and this out of this clash something new a reconciliation might happen this is the idea of thesis and anti anti uh, thesis uh, that is not specifically in the context of structuralism that is in the context of hegelian uh, uh, dialectics and marxian dialectics um now v- victor so what yeah. do you say uh, mr shiva it... yeah yeah i'm here please continue yeah. yeah mr shiva there are some questions posted in the live chat of youtube channel okay yeah the question is uh, could you please tell us the difference between structuralism and post structuralism and deconstruction posted by ani structuralism post structuralism and deconstruction yeah my uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting i've been trying to <laughs> sort of uh, um articulate these differences but uh, nevertheless it's okay uh now you could say that post structuralism is a radical alternative of structuralism and what do i mean by that structuralism is interested in finding out binaries it is interested in identifying the basic fundamental elements of any text any culture you give it a culture or a text or a literary or non literary text what structuralism would do is it will go and find out those basic components the narrator the narrative the heterodigetic narrator the homodigetic narrator all these compositional features constitutive features and that is it means this business there now post structuralism begins exactly at that point and it would go and say see it's not enough that you find out binaries it's good that you find out binaries now we have to talk about the constructed of the constructedness of the binary and also we have to talk about the hierarchy of power built into this binary binary is not innocent now structuralism would say that every society comprises of the binary between man and woman end of the story post structuralism would say no that's not the end of the story because of certain cultural or or social circumstances or because of a certain ideology man becomes the omnipotent being whereas woman becomes the subservient category of every society how does that happen and it shouldn't be it shouldn't be happening because both are constructs if both are constructs then how can one become you know superior when you start asking that question you become a post structuralist now about deconstruction deconstruction is a is a specific methodology uh i wouldn't even call it a methodology a specific way of looking at things invented by uh not even invented it developed by uh, uh derrida and derrida does not even say that i invented it derrida says deconstruction has been there in the text for a long time people have been using it but they did not know that they were using deconstruction now deconstruction again is not something that we do on a text 
it's not like you take a text and open it and then you deconstruct it no 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 that's not the way it is deconstruction is the way in which language exists because everything since everything is language since everything is constructed in language you cannot have a uh, you know a fundamental signified or transcendental signified in language this is roughly the idea of deconstruction and deconstruction yes uh, sometimes we say that uh, post structuralism is synonymous with deconstruction but that's not the point because some other post structuralists like julia kristeva or lacan for example Lacan is not a deconstructionist he is a psychoanalyst so there are different branches to deconstruct I mean start post structuralism and deconstruction is one of the uh, one of the most important branches of uh, of 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 post structuralism i hope i have answered your question i have a question by victor here let me try to take it up um what would you say about the critique of post structuralism by po- ah ha ha that's a very interesting question. um the extreme case of post structuralism would be uh the contemporary post theory debate the debate uh which uh, sort of initiated by the film critics the lacanian uh, the the the, uh, the film critics who critique lacan uh and then they say that uh, there is a hegemony of post structuralism post structuralism tries to dismantle everything but then again post structuralism becomes the hegemonic dogmatic system that is true to a certain extent uh because even though um Uh, derrida even though derrida goes about uh, uh, saying that uh, everything can be deconstructed uh, there's no inherent value to everything we attribute a lot of value to derrida and grammatology and, and, and i mean it goes like that so i would say that it is not post structuralists who are critis- criticizing post structuralism some post structuralists like lacan and julia kristeva and michel foucault they were inventing their own forms of post structuralism because there is no monolithic system there cannot be a monolithic system if it is a monolithic single book uh, you know kind of thing then it is not post structuralism post structuralism by its very principle by its you know constitutively is heterogeneous it cannot be single so i wouldn't say it is a critique i would say it is a uh, it, it's a it's a variation of post structuralism and of course there are people criticizing post structuralism also like the post theory people uh yeah that that that's all and th- there are people like Jonathan Kalla who is still a structuralist who still in the, even today tries to sort of problematize the post structural notions and that's there it's it's all, it's there um yes yeah that's just to shiva there is one yeah. more question okay yeah uh, in the um, youtube channel uh, could you please differentiate the concept of gender in the context of structuralism and post structuralism and another question is what is aporia in post structuralism okay so gender is a very good uh, uh, thing now i would say that uh, one of the hallmarks of uh, one of the hallmarks of post structuralism is its association with the gender debate with feminism now uh, i was repeatedly talking about julia kristeva now please understand that almost all those female centric writers or feminist writers were adopting uh, post structural theories theories of derrida and foucault and all these to sort of advance their feminist ideologies or feminist interventions now why why is there a relationship between feminism and post structuralism because post structuralism is constitutively against uh dogmatic or hegemony or center that is the point post structuralism is always against the idea of a unifying center around which everything develops and that's where derrida introduces his classic notion that there is uh, the center is not inside the text but the center is away from the center in other words whatever that gives you meaning you read a book when you read a book you think that the meaning comes from the book the the, the printed words on the book meaning does not come from the printed words in the book meaning actually comes from a larger cultural source outside the text you know otherwise had that been not the case uh, if i give you a chinese text you can just open the text and read the text and you should be able to get the meaning if meaning is inherently there in the text no meaning is already there in the outside world now uh these decentering notions of post structuralism are adopted by feminism and gender debate uh people like julia uh, sorry people like judith butler 
and all these people take this up and they say that see the binary between man and woman is an unnatural binary there is no binary like that there is no perfect man who fits into the ideology of a man or the image of a man and there is no perfect woman who fits into the image of a woman these are constructs we are just gray uh, people who live in the gray shade so there are some masculine qualities there are some feminine qualities and we are a bundle of everything number one number two they would also say that uh, everything that we attribute to a man like masculinity like aggression like uh, the the desire to have technological knowledge uh, uh, the the desire to control everything all these things are culturally constructed not inherent in the biology gender becomes to use butlerian notion a performative discourse gender is something that you perform right it's not something that is inherently built into you just like language language is a performance meaning is not inherent in the word something that we attribute now this is our post structuralism is connected with uh, the gender debate and again with structuralism i don't think uh, the, the the feminists were in pursuit of the structural the, uh, structural ideas because structural ideas as i told you were completely anti humanistic they were not interested in people who read people's emotion and to the extreme if you if you look at it deeper as i told you before so sure was not even interested in the actual thing he was always talking about the image you know so uh, i think the uh, the question of feminism who is uh, is relevant in the context of post structural especially in the lacanian context where lacan's law of the father uh, it's something that julia kristeva takes up and then uh, forms her own uh, no notion of feminism and that's how it is connected i hope i have answered that question and now aporia aporia according to derrida is an ampus it's the end of everything in other words you take a cabbage right you pe- you try to peel it off now what is the general idea of something at the bottom we are always in search of something at the bottom which anchors everything something must be there which is controlling everything now if you peel off the cabbage you would realize that at the bottom of the cabbage there is nothing it's just absence this is aporia aporia is that state where you realize that nothing is there it's an endless pit it is an abyss and according to derrida language is aporic in the sense that if you try to look at language and try to find out meaning you know all your communication the way i communicate to you the way you communicate to me it is based on the assumption that there is something in the word which gets communicated now this act of communication is a cultural thing if you just peel it off if you just peel language off there's nothing it's just signifier there is no meaning in it the word tree has nothing to do with the actual tree the actual tree could be called by any name all right so th- this is the sense in which uh, derrida uses the term aporia all right i hope that uh, i have answered that question yes is there any other question yes we have one by mr titus does deconstruction problematize the advaitic concept of being ah <laughs> um i'm not quite sure. i'm not quite sure about the advaitic concept of being but all i know is that derrida was a very good scholar of 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 of, of sanskrit uh, text and uh, he was very much uh, interested in the spada theory uh, of being and uh, i don't wish to comment on that any further because i'm not in possession of uh, uh, valid information on advaitic notion of being i'm sorry about that any other question i think there are no more questions there is one by harita hari venkatesh okay. it is uh... is derridian deconstruction similar to hedger's concept of destruction ah destruction? okay now heidegger and derrida hmm i would say that uh yes uh, to a certain extent you could say that there is a connection but again i wouldn't call heidegger a post structuralist heidegger would more appropriately be categorized as a, as an as a phenomenologist Uh, a phenomenologist who believes that uh, the external thing is not the point but how you see the external thing that, that that is the point now phenomenology in a certain qualified sense is a 
is akin to post-structuralism because while Derrida was talking about post-structuralism, around the same time, we had Heidegger and all these phenomenologists inventing their own notions of phenomena. Now, uh, in the context of phenomenology, we would say that uh, uh, the signified uh, or the external, I mean, not the signified, the referent, the external reality, the thing that is there in the external world, we don't give any importance to that. It's not that, uh, I mean, it, it, how do I look at that? How do I experience that? How do I get the experience of the phenomena? That's where it becomes important. Now, in that sense, I wouldn't say that deconstruction and phenomenology are together. Because deconstruction is not about experience of something. Deconstruction never talks about your experience of a being in the real being in the real world. First of all, deconstruction never even talks about the reality out there because the reality out there is always enmeshed in language. It's only through language that you can uh, get to that reality. So there's no point in talking about the experience of it. Fundamentally, it's a flawed experience. This is the way in which uh, the discussion um, you know, proceeds. Uh, uh, that's all I would like to talk about that question. Yeah. Any other question? There is one by Disna. Can we sideline residual ideology only as a thing of the past without any dominant role to play in the present scenario? Ah, that's a very complicated question. Uh, you, could, you could always say that residual ideology um, has a certain power. Yeah, since it's an ideology, it has power. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, now, in the context of India, we always say that uh, we are living the residual ideology of feudalism in India, even though we call ourselves democratic. We are not democratic in the proper sense of the term, because uh, look at all our actions. Somewhere there is a sense of feudalism built into everything that we do, the kind of respect that the, the idea of respect that we have for elders, the idea of uh, value that we attach to certain things. We are not democratic in the proper sense. We are in the, I would say, a conflict between the residual ideology of feudalism and the emergent ideology of democracy. Now, I would say, no, you again, you can't say that residual ideology is completely a thing of the past. It is also something of the present with a severe impact on the way in which you perceive the present world. Yes, I agree with that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is that fine? Yeah, I hope that's fine. Then there is Anupam Devnath. He's asking about the difference between trace and hauntology. Ah, Okay, ontology again is a terminology introduced by Derrida. Uh, ontology, and then haunt. I mean, it, it's a pun on the word ontology. Ontology is the study of being. You know, being as a material presence, uh, being as something which is really there. Now, Derrida introduces a counter notion, and he would say you no longer can talk about ontology, you will rather have to talk about hauntology because there is a ghost of non-present signifi signifiers revolving around you all the time. The question is, who is a being? Am I a full being? No, I mean, there is a teacher in me, there is a student in me, there is, uh, it, th this is just a simple plain explanation. I'm not getting to the nitty gritties of it. There are so many different aspects of me. What am I? I am all this. Right now, I'm talking to you as a, as a teacher, as a research scholar, but that's not the identity that I have when I walk out of the room. So all these different, uh, you know, different forms of things, different signifiers exist in the pa paradigmatic axis of language. And then I choose whatever that is relevant and put it in the syntagmatic axis and I form a syntax of being. Every being inherently involves the presence and absence of all other possible signifiers. So instead of talking about a fully present transcendental signified being, you would rather have to talk about a being which is absent, a, a, a being which contains the traces of all the absent beings. Uh, this is the sense in which he introduces the notion of hauntology. And then there was, uh, there was another question. Yeah, it was, it was about hauntology, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Thank I you. hope that is fine. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shiv Shankar, for such a vibrant and energizing session. Uh, let me invite Ms. Sandhya, Assistant Professor, PG Department of English, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Is it audible? Yeah, it's audible. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Hari O. A very good afternoon to everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for today's session. On behalf of Chinat's family, I express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Shiv Shankar Rajmohan AK, the resource person of today's webinar on the topic Structuralism to Post-Structuralism. The session has uh, rendered a profound insight into the topic. It was really engaging and informative. Um, it was so kind of you, sir, to have answered all the queries put forth by our participants. Thank you so much, sir. Let me extend my gratitude to our principal, Dr. K.V. Surendran, sir, for encouraging and supporting us in all our endeavors. Thank you, sir. A very special thanks to Dr. Sajan, sir, for his support and help in organizing this webinar. Thank you, sir. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank the IQAC coordinator, Ms. Anita Haritas, department, uh, head of the Department of Computer Application for coordinating and hosting the session. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my sincere thanks to Ms. Lara Lakshmanan for introducing the resource person. Finally, let me thank all the participants here for their support and cooperation for successfully completing the session. Uh, thank you all. Uh, have a nice day. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sandhya. Uh, participants, the attendance and feedback form link is posted in the chat box. Please fill in your details to receive your e-certificate. And please see that if you have attended all the three sessions under the uh, topic Understanding the Transformations, you will be receiving the e-certificate to your email ID. And uh, by 24th, again 11 a.m., we will be on with the third se uh, lecture, I mean third session of the lecture series, Understanding the Transformation by Dr. Sargent, sir. And the whole session is also live streaming with the recorded version will also be available in our YouTube channel. You can watch it later also. Uh, let me extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Shiv Shankar for such a an informative and a very, very vibrant session. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, participants. If you have filled the application form, sorry, if you have filled the form, uh, you may leave the meeting and the form will be active only for 30 minutes. Thank you, Shiva, yeah, once Shiva, again. Uh, yeah, Shiva, I think the uh, maybe the um, bandwidth in your end is not so good. Is it so? Yeah, but I can hear you perfectly well. Yeah, but your video was so breaking. Yeah. Okay. Because from our I'm end, sorry, it was uh, good. We have, yeah, the um, optical cable connection. So there is no problem from our end. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Must be because of the range. I mean, it was, rain, yeah, it was raining cats and dogs probably, in the morning. Yeah. But it was so good. The presentation and everything. Yeah. We will be always having it in our YouTube channel, the session. I think you, uh, Shiva, uh, you already have a comment uh, given by Ms. Nivedita Kumar. Yeah. I don't know if you have read that. She says, Mr. S. Rajmohan, I wish you were my teacher for the paper of criticism. I might have done very well in the class and exams. But perhaps <laughs> she's very, very senior. But perhaps you were not even born then. I completed my master's in 1988. And still I got to revise a lot today. That is what you gave everything to us in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah. That's the it best compliment, I think. Yeah, from the senior most yeah. person, the best compliment you have got. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So we're very grateful to you, Shiva. And Thank we hope you. to see you in our session on uh, 24th with Dr. Sargent. I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, be there with us, Shiva. Sure, sure. Thank you so much once again. Okay, ma. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank bye, you. Bye. On behalf of Chinmay Arts and Science College for Women. I thank all the participants, the resource person, the head of the department and our dear principal for supporting us. Thank you. Thank you one and all.
bien. Je vais monter là. Thank <laughs> you. 